week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we examined three of the most compelling cases of alien abduction, at least in my opinion. I mean, the possibility that aliens exist is very likely. I don't know if I believe most of what you're about to say. I just don't understand how you could believe in aliens, but then just not, you know, believe in the prospect that they could maybe kind of, you know, poke around a little bit. Well, Put a little rod up your butthole, stuff like that. I don't know. I don't think they're here. <laughs> okay. That's it. Well, I'm gonna get into it now. Here we go. The first case is the abduction of Travis Walton. On Wednesday, November 5th, 1975, Travis Walton was working in a seven-man tree thinning crew in Apache Sitgreaves National Forest near Heber, Arizona. At the end of the day, on the drive back home, Travis noticed a bright light coming through the trees. When the men got closer, they saw that it was, quote, a strange golden disc, end quote, hovering stationary about 20 feet off the ground with a 15 to 20 foot diameter and eight to 10 foot width. Though his coworkers warned that he should stay away, Travis approached the craft, hearing loud vibrations as the craft began spinning erratically. Suddenly, a blue green light sprung from the craft, striking Travis in the chest and head, catapulting him backwards several feet. Do you think Travis was me in this situation? No. Oh yeah, yeah, Travis is the guy who dies first in a scary movie. Yeah, because in that situation, I probably would walk toward it and then that'd be the end of me. <laughs> what would your thought be as you walk towards this extremely bright light through the trees? Like, get a load of this shit. That's the last thought you'd have in your head? I'd probably be curious, I'd walk toward it. What would make you curious enough to walk towards it? What, uh, Cause like, you have a scientific mind, you see this bright light coming through the trees, what do you think it is at first glance? Aurora Borealis or something? You would be the best person to get abducted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the aliens would get tired of me. <laughs> They'd kick me off. You'd be like, oh, good costumes. Yeah. Travis remembers, quote, all I felt was the numbing force of a blow that felt like a high voltage electrocution. My mind sank quickly into unfeeling blackness, end quote. Having witnessed this, Travis's friends fled the scene, assuming Travis to be dead. Aren't these like burly lumberjacks? What are they afraid of? I, I mean, I would be afraid of a giant spinning disc that shocked my friend. It sounds like kind of a funny image when you think of it though. A bunch of scared lumberjacks. No, you're like your big burly friend being like, no, check it out. And then just, <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just running. His eyeballs pop out. Yeah, just yeah. smoking. In their retreat, one of the men observed the saucer fly up to the top of the trees and away to the Northeast. Some of the men returned to the scene out of guilt, only to find that Travis was no longer there. So they went back for him. Mm -hmm. It took them a day to come to their senses, but if you see some crazy shit, uh, your, your impulse is to run, at least a normal person's impulse is to run. Just bring a gun. Sure, okay, let's, okay, let's pretend they had guns. Yeah. There's a giant hovering disc that's spinning at top speed. Shoot and shot it a with your fucking gun. And shot a bolt of lightning through a man's chest and your solution is to shoot at it with a pistol? Better than, better than standing there and let it shock you and poop your pants How and How about fall? run, what they did? Huh? This no. is why you would die first in a movie. So basically what we just went over was the experience as witnessed by all these men. Mm -hmm. Now, let's board the train to Crazy Town and go into Travis's recollection of what happened when he woke up. And this is only his recollection. Before we get into this, is there anything we need to know about Travis? No. Okay. Normal dude. Normal dude. According to Travis's own writing about the experience, Travis awoke in what appeared to be a medical office or lab with a triangular ceiling among three humanoid beings with large brown eyes and abnormally large heads. They stood under five feet tall and were wearing soft, billowy orange-brown overalls. What? <laughs> they're like minions? <laughs> yeah, I guess they were like minions. Now I'm just gonna imagine this guy being operated on by minions. <laughs> Travis attacked the three beings, who then retreated. As Travis explored other rooms in an attempt to escape, he encountered a large, muscular man wearing a helmet, who forced him out of the craft into a warehouse with other saucers, eventually leading him into another room with three more people, all very good looking. Quote, two men and a woman were standing around the table. They were all wearing velvety blue uniforms like the first man's, except that they had no helmets. The two men had the same muscularity and the same masculine good looks as the first man. The woman also had a face and figure that was the epitome of her gender. They were smooth skinned and blemishless. No moles, freckles, wrinkles, or scars marked their skin. This guy sounds a little bit creepy right now. Because you'd think if you were on a spaceship, 
what? Internalizing a lot of information right now. You know, you're surrounded by aliens. Suddenly you see other people and you're not like, you don't go up to them and say, hey, what the fuck is going on? Instead, you're looking at them going, no blemishes. <laughs> I'm just smooth like porcelain. I'm imagining the epitome of her gender. I'm imagining. Oh, it's creepy. The striking good looks of the man I had first met became more obvious on seeing them all together. They shared a family-like resemblance, although they were not identical. End quote. These people gently pushed him onto a table and put a mask over his mouth and nose. At which point, Travis passed out. The next thing Travis knew, he was lying on the ground in Heber, Arizona. He saw a silvery disc-shaped craft hovering above the road near him, which then flew straight up into the sky and disappeared silently. Although he only believed he was gone for an hour or an hour and a half, he later learned he had been missing for five days. Over this period of five days, the rest of Travis's crew came under investigation for Travis's disappearance. During this investigation, the suspects underwent psychiatric testing and polygraphs, during which none of the men confessed to faking the abduction. All of the later lie detector tests administered to Travis and the other witnesses came back as passing or inconclusive. A psychiatrist suspected that the entire abduction was in Travis's imagination, but could not explain why the others went along with it. In a recent HuffPost Weird News podcast, Travis said, quote, about 15 years later, it was discovered that the trees nearest to where the UFO hovered had been producing wood fiber at 36 times the rate it had been in the 85 years before that. A complete core sampling revealed that this thickened growth was only on the side of the trees towards or in the direction that the craft had been, end quote. As if this case couldn't get any more bizarre, Travis appeared on Fox's Moment of Truth game show where a polygraph was conducted on stage. This particular polygraph determined that he was not telling the truth about his abduction. Regardless, Travis maintains that the events transpired as he has told them. His polygraph and all the witnesses' polygraphs that were taken earlier in an official place were all uh, passing or inconclusive. So that's what matters to me. I think this game show thing doesn't really prove shit. Is he still alive? He's still alive. Can't we just, wow. Anytime anyone has inconclusive evidence about a polygraph like that, just Bring him back in. How hard is that? I suppose. Where you at, Travis? Where you at? <laughs> you want him to tell you about the orange billowy you I want to hear uh, about overalls? it. I want to ask him why he was so obsessed with their skin. What was the fabric like? Was it denim? It was a fine lame. <laughs> The second case is the abduction of Linda Napolitano. UFOologist Bud Hopkins worked closely with Linda to document and publicize her case. On November 30th, 1989, around 3.15 a.m. in New York City, Linda Napolitano claimed she awoke to find short aliens around her bed. She found herself unable to wake up her husband as she perceived the beings to be telling her to be quiet in an odd language. The three beings then levitated her outside her 12th story apartment window, floating in a blue-white light up into a clamshell-shaped spaceship. Okay, wait, hang on a sec though. Let's pause. She thought they were telling her to be quiet. Mm -hmm. Was she scared? Is this why she just went with it? I'm gonna assume that there must be some kind of calming influence to them. Okay. Like, I don't think they would just go into, like you don't break into someone's house and go, shh. <laughs> right, without that person going, what the fuck? <laughs> I know, especially if you look like a minion. Once inside, the beings experimented on her, including putting an instrument inside her nose. After, she woke up nearly two hours later at 5 a.m. next to her husband in bed. In 1991, two years after the abduction, Linda reached out to Hopkins with an X-ray of her nose showing a cylindrical object that Hopkins describes as having, quote, spiraling extensions that curl out away from her face, end quote. The X-ray was taken by podiatric surgeon and Linda's niece, Lisa Bayer. Shortly after, Linda claimed the object was removed during another abduction. Hopkins reports that Linda visited a nose and throat specialist who confirmed the object was gone. A conspicuous ridge of built up cartilage showed where it had once been embedded. I don't like nose stuff. Neither do I. If we captured an alien, the first thing we would do is try to figure out their anatomy. We would say, okay, what's this hole do? I feel like you'd at least try oh, shit, to talk to it or, or observe it and not just shove shit into its holes. 
I mean, in science, there's a certain amount of guess and check, and that may mean you accidentally stick your finger in a butthole or two. That's just, that's, that's science. They it's, also have small fingers, right? I'm sure they have small, but well, long. E.T. E had a long finger, so he could get some distance e. in. He could go way up into that butthole. E.T. would be a good doctor. He would be. Ouch. <laughs> These details are somewhat common among abduction tales, but what makes this case famous are the supposed witnesses to the event. In 1991, nearly two years after Linda's abduction, Hopkins received a letter from a police officer detailing an experience with his partner in November 1989. The two were sitting underneath the FDR bridge when they saw a blue light with a woman being levitated alongside three strange beings as they made their way into the light. They reportedly felt guilty for not helping the woman and one officer had a nervous breakdown, spending nights parked underneath her building. They're cops! Okay. Take out your guns and start shooting the light. And if you can't hit the light, then shoot the lady in the head because obviously you don't want her to go out of outer space. You'd be the worst diplomat when it comes to alien human relations. Every fucking solution you've offered is shoot at them with their gun. What do you want? What that? The, the, we shoot at people if they're in a no-fly zone. You know, we'll shoot down a plane if it doesn't, if it's, if it's unidentified and it's not supposed to be somewhere, sure. Not every fucking alien interaction is Independence Day. Sometimes it could be like E.T. What if they just want to come and have a, a beautiful relationship with didn't, a little boy named Elliot? Didn't even Carl Sagan, didn't he say? Oh my God, again with the fucking I Carl just Sagan. Think, he God. said if aliens ever come here, it's not going to be pretty. Hopkins told Linda not to speak with the officers if they reached out to her to avoid contaminating their accounts. Unfortunately, the two visited Linda multiple times on their own volition revealing their names to be Richard and Dan, looking for answers about what they saw that night. Linda directed them to Hopkins, and in a few weeks, Hopkins received a letter. This letter revealed that the two officers were actually bodyguards on a security detail for, quote, an important political figure, end quote. This political figure, who was also present with the two bodyguards during the abduction, also signed the letter, albeit under the moniker, him. Some UFOologists believe this figure is the former Secretary General of the UN, Javier Perez de Quilar. However, while this seems impressive in terms of proof, it should be noted that Hopkins never physically met with Richard and Dan, and only corresponded via letters. This has led many to believe that Hopkins was the victim of a hoax, where either Linda made up Richard and Dan alone, or Linda and a group of people coordinated to complete the hoax. Do we have records of these people being real? I, I mean, like, <laughs> I haven't seen those records. You haven't seen those records. But that's because it's to protect their identity. Why are they so nervous about their identity? Because it's embarrassing, and if they found- So they could put a rest, they could- They tried to get the, the political figure to confess. They couldn't, because obviously he'd be mocked forever if he said, I saw a lady floating out of her 12 store window in a blue light. Like, that obviously does not sound like something you'd want from, from a political figure, a man making important decisions. One takedown of the story in the book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, cites a person who formerly served in Dignitary Protective Services, who explained that details of the night of the abduction provided by Richard and Dan didn't line up with security protocol for moving officials. Womp womp. I mean, take that for what it is. Okay. Also, I don't imagine that a uh, security protocol for moving officials has like a fucking like page or two dedicated to what happens if an alien ship lands above you. But at this level, you'd think they would be professionals, right? It's an alien! Still, according to Sean F. Mears, a UFO and alien abduction researcher who worked with Hopkins, there are 23 witnesses on the public record, ranging from family and friends to complete strangers. Three of these strangers worked at the nearby New York Post one of whom was an investigative reporter named Steve Dunleavy. Despite the questioned credibility of the two main witnesses, Linda maintains the truth lies in all the witnesses. She has said, quote, if I was hallucinating, then the witnesses saw my hallucination. That sounds crazier than the whole abduction phenomenon, end quote. There were a lot of witnesses. It's juicy. I'm just saying, her quote makes sense to me. Yeah, this, this one, I would buy this over... Travis Walton yeah. and other like Allagash and all that shit. Yeah. The third case is the abduction of Frederick Valentich. This case is a little different from the others in that the abducted person never returned. On October 21st, 1978, at 619 PM, instructor pilot Frederick Valentich began the flight from Moorabbin Airport in Victoria, Australia to King Island, Tasmania over the Bass Strait in a Cessna 182L. His destination was only about an hour away. Visibility was good, and there were only light winds. 
Belentich, 20 years old at the time, reportedly wanted to get more flight hours in. Belentich made contact with Steve Roby at air traffic control in Melbourne between 7.06 and 7.12 p.m. During the transmission, Belentich asked whether there was any known aircraft in his area. After air traffic control said there was not, Valentich claimed a large unknown aircraft was flying about 1,000 feet above him at a fast speed with four bright lights. Valentich then reportedly said, quote, it seems to be playing some sort of game. He's flying over me. It's not an aircraft, end quote. What does he mean by it's not an aircraft? It didn't look like any aircraft he'd ever seen before. Okay. Pretty cool. Oh, he's saying like, it doesn't look like an airplane? Yeah, I mean, like he's also probably not thinking through his words right now, he's seeing a fucking alien ship You always go with this. They're not thinking about their words. Because they're not. It's an a There's an alien in front of you. You're not going to be the most well-spoken you've ever been in front of an alien. Yeah, sure. Okay. He continued to describe the craft, saying, quote, It seems like it's stationary. What I'm doing right now is orbiting, and the thing is just orbiting on top of me. Also, it's got a green light and sort of metallic. It's shiny on the outside. It's just vanished. End quote. His last message around 7.12 p.m. to air traffic control was, quote, uh, Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering, and it's not an aircraft. End quote. After 17 seconds of silence, there was a loud sound of metal scraping. Authorities are said to have searched the area for four days, but found nothing, and Valentich was never seen again. What do you think of the 17 seconds of silence and then just metal sounds? I love it. It's horrifying. It's great. <laughs> it's, it's honestly like reading that gave me chills. Yeah, it's uh, good. So wait a second. I'm, I'm just confused because normally at this point, I'm used to wanting to rip your head off. But right now we are in agreement that this is pretty plausible. I think I'm just very discerning with my abduction stories. Like I said, I do believe in aliens, but I don't believe that most people I'm not buying a lot of the encounters that people describe because a lot of times they don't, it's, you know, it seems like they're either trying to cash in or they're just insane. But this, I don't know. What are you, you know, cashing in for if you disappear forever? What are you cashing for if you disappear forever? In May 1982, the Aircraft Accident Investigation Summary's cause of the accident read, quote, the reason for the disappearance of the aircraft has not been determined, end quote. A. Woodward, the man who signed off on the report, offered pure, unfiltered speculation that Valentich could have been disoriented, suicidal, or even the victim of a meteorite crash. Meteorites don't hover over. It wasn't an alien, he got hit by a meteor. <laughs> it was a big fireball, I see it. <laughs> no, what the fuck? You don't disprove something that's unbelievable by something that's even more unbelievable. Also, we would have records of a meteorite crashing and hitting the fucking Earth. One alternate theory comes from a feature story in a 2013 issue of Skeptical Inquirer. The story mentions that Valentich was inexperienced as a pilot and had supposedly been sighted twice for deliberately flying blind into a cloud. According to another source, Valentich was reportedly fascinated with UFOs and even had a UFO scrapbook with him when he disappeared. Okay, and never mind. Oh dear, I, I, was, wait, I no. was waiting for the other shoe to drop. This is what happened. This has happened a couple other times. Yeah, these. yeah. You always present a very, like, you get the case presented in a way that makes me say, all right. There's strong rhetoric to build bad. up to that, right? Yeah, you do a pretty good job of that. And then and then you throw something like this in, like, he was obsessed with UFOs okay, and wrote was, fan fiction about himself I, dying at the hand of I a didn't, UFO. I did not say that. I said reportedly fascinated with UFOs. The publication Skeptical Inquirer posits that Valentich's experience was some mixture of wanting to see something, being easily led to believe that anything he didn't recognize was a UFO, becoming disoriented, and or mistaking stars and the Cessna's own lights as lights from another object. They discredit him a fair amount. I don't think Not so. Not entirely, I still find it convincing. I mean, I find it intriguing because I, the uh, plain UFO encounters are always the most convincing to me. However, it should be mentioned that other sources contest that Valentich was an experienced pilot. It's also worth noting that the Cessna 182 planes were designed to float in the case of a water landing. Historian Reg Watson has also found numerous reports of UFO sightings, including reports of cigar-shaped lights seen near King Island, Australia for two months prior to Valentich's disappearance. A farmer allegedly saw a craft flying over his land near Adelaide the morning after Valentich vanished. He claimed that Valentich's plane was stuck to the side of the craft. 
Furthermore, one of the last pieces of information on record was Valentich reaching Cape Otway at 7 p.m. Here's a photograph taken off Cape Otway 20 minutes before Valentich vanished that shows a strange shape in the sky. Let's see the picture. All right. Here we go. Right there. See? What are we looking at here? That's the sky and that's the weird object. If this is legit, this, is, this corroborates But this also line. doesn't look like a UFO either, does it? Well, we don't really know what a UFO looks like, do we? Looks like some, like, like God spit out his gum. Sure, but, but you saying this doesn't really look like a UFO is exactly the same thing as saying like, oh, this doesn't look like a lava monster. But you because just- Because we don't know what a lava monster looks like. We don't know what a UFO looks like. They're apparently made up. So until we see definitive proof, I think that it, this is a very strong case that this happened. And you're welcome to think that. Oh my God. That's fine. Ultimately, nobody can say for sure if aliens are real, let alone alien abductions. Until we procure solid physical evidence beyond eyewitness testimony, the lore behind aliens and abduction will likely remain just that, lore. Hopefully one day we'll have a definitive answer. But for now, whether or not aliens abduct humans will remain unsolved. Can you at least say that you're, uh, you have some sort of ambivalence to this? I will say that there is a possibility that some of these have a shred of truth to them. All right, get out. That's not what it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Ah, my butthole! <laughs> Ouch. Hey Ryan, I like your shirt. Thanks, I like yours too. Thanks, buy it here.